acted on a positive charge. If it's a negative charge, the other way. Now, problem one, you were very quite lucky not to have to turn in. It was an exam problem. You're going to have a problem like that, I promised you, a problem like that on your final exam. When this was on an exam, most of the students missed it. And the reason they missed it is because they got the wrong angle theta. Some of them put 20, some of them put 70. But that angle is the angle between the motion, in this case, that proton is going east and parallel to the floor. It's the, the angle between the motion and the B field. Okay? Now the question is, what's this angle here? Yeah, a lot of people could not see that this was 90 degrees. Now, if I had it like that, would that be 90 degrees? Yeah, that's 90 degrees. And now? I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Still 90 degrees. Okay, now that's why you want to bring these props with you uh, to the exam. So that you can visualize things in three dimensions. You can put one uh, prop in the direction of the velocity and the other one in the direction of the B field. And ask yourself, what's that angle? You know, and it will be obvious then that it's 90 degrees. What if this proton was going straight up towards the ceiling? What would the angle be? Tell your neighbor. Talk to your neighbor. Okay. If the velocity is up, and the B field is down 70 degrees from horizontal, you want this angle. Okay? If that angle's 90 and that angle's 70, that's 160. Is that right? 160. Okay, let's go back to this problem here. In this problem, the answer was 90 degrees. Now, we find a number that none of you care about because we didn't have to turn that one in, but it's 4 times 10 to the minus 17 newtons. That's an incredibly small force. But you remember that it's acting on an incredibly, actually a doubly incredibly small mass. 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And so this is going to cause an acceleration so large that if this were you instead of the proton, it would kill you instantly. Huge acceleration. Okay? Now, what direction is this proton being pushed, shoved, by the magnetic field? With your finger, point in the direction. Oh, we're not a, not a lot of finger pointers in this class. You've been taught by your parents not to point fingers. Yes, question. The example in the book. In the book. Example nineteen dash two. Um nineteen point two. The particle was pointing was going north towards Canada and parallel to the ground and the B field is north towards Canada and 70 degrees. There I had this angle. In your homework the particle was going east towards Boston and parallel to the ground and the B field was still towards the north. The difference is between the particle going north and the particle going east. Does that seem like the same problem to you? No, good, good. Okay. So what direction, people? You've had time to think. North, straight north? Okay, use right hand rule number one. Reach in the direction of the motion towards Boston, east, and then you turn your wrist so that you can wave in the direction of the B field, down 70 degrees, and that gives you a direction 
Notice that this force is perpendicular to the V-field. It's also perpendicular to the velocity. The force will always be perpendicular to those two vectors. The velocity and the V-field. Okay, check that your neighbor's on the bus, please. <clears throat> okay. Now, right hand rule number two. gives the direction of B for a straight wire. Carrying conventional current. And remember, when the wire is straight, we use the straight part of our right hand to represent the current through the wire. The curved part tells us which way the field lines wrap around the wire. It's just a memory device. If the conventional current's going this way, then those field lines are going to wrap around that way. By right hand rule number two. Okay? Now last day we saw these uh, pictures here. This was the field due to a long straight wire from a side view. And this is from the end view where the current is coming towards you. Now this is the more useful view. Because you can see that even though the direction is the same here and here, the magnitude is not. We can't really derive this without a little bit of calculus. I don't want to go there. But the result is that twice as far from a wire is half as strong. Uh, you know, in this class, you're going to use that once. And it's going to be on your tutorial homework on the back page, last question. That's where you'll use this particular idea. Uh, pretty much the only place. Now remember, those are tangent to the field line. Okay, the field line is the green circle, and this vector right here only tells me the magnetic field right at that dot. Okay, that's a magne magnetic field vector. The field lines paint the picture of the field everywhere. If I wanted the field there, it would be in a direction tangent to the field line. If I wanted the field there, it would be in a direction tangent to the field line or down. It, it paints the picture throughout a region. Okay? Now last day we found the force between two wires carrying current in the same direction. And we found that they attracted each other. I showed you current going in opposite directions that repelled, let's see why that is. If I'm looking for the force on wire one, I remind myself of what I don't care about. There's lots of things I don't care about. Oh, I can't say that. That'll offend the biology department. Uh, <laughs> like chemistry and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and all sorts of people. What I don't care about is the field due to wire one. Wire one doesn't push on itself, it's being pushed on by wire two. So I want to know what the field looks like due to wire two. That's what I care about. Now I know by the right hand rule number two that those field lines due to wire two wrap around, wrap around this way. I use my right hand rule number two, wrap around. And that tells me what the field looks like everywhere in the room. But again, I don't care about it everywhere in the room. I care about it over here where it's doing the pushing. And over there, the field lines are wrapping around this wire and they're going into the board right there. They're going into the board. Okay? Now, once the magnetic field has been set up, I need to use a right hand rule to give me the push, the force. What right hand rule gives me the push? One. 
So I reach in the direction of the motion. It doesn't matter how I reach. I've got to turn my wrist so that I can wave in the direction of the B field. The turning of my wrist so that I can wave forces my thumb in the direction of the force. Now, I could use, just, just use Newton's third law and say if, if uh, two pushes one to the left, then one pushes two to the right. But what if I don't believe Newton's third law? What if I was raised in a house of unbelievers? You know, just, I don't know. And so I would have to go back to the beginning. And I would say the force on two is caused by one. So now I care about the field created by wire one. Well, it's got current going up, which means its field lines go around this way. I don't care about the field everywhere, only over here where it's doing the pushing at that dot. Okay? Now, if the current in one is going up, the field lines are going around, they're going into the board over there. Into the board. Okay? Now, I can use right hand rule number one. I reach in the direction of the flow. I turn my wrist so that I can wave in the direction of the B field. And my thumb is pointing to the right. And what I find is, hey, Newton's third law is true. Uh, if two pushes on one to the left, one pushes on two to the right. Questions on that? Okay. Now, in tutorial, you found the magnetic field due to a loop. And the way they, they did that is by looking at a loop as a series of straight wires. <clears throat> well, let's first of all concentrate on the current in that top wire. Paint it red. Now, by right hand rule number two, I put my thumb in the direction of the current. It's the field's going to go into the board at the top and out of the board down here. Okay? Into the board up there, out of the board there. Then I look at this piece here. If conventional current's going over to, to the left, it's got to come, come down. And that means that my thumb has to point down. And that means that the B field is going to be into the board out there, out of the board in here. Okay? Then I look at this wire here. It's going to the right, so that's going to give me out of the board up there, and this is a little hard to do without breaking my wrist, into the board down there. Okay? And that last one is just the same. Now, what I have are a bunch of field lines that come out of the center and then wrap back around outside. <coughs> they come out of the center and then wrap back around. Well, that looks familiar. Now, I'm going to turn that. I'm going to turn that this way. Okay? As if I... Let's let this represent the loop. I'm going to turn it that way. Okay? Now... If a whole bunch of field lines are coming out towards you, imagine that coming out towards you. When I turn this this way, those field lines are going to be pointing towards the open door, are they not? So I'm going to rotate that, and that's what it looks like. Well, let's think about this. The current's going to the right here. If I rotate that, the current at the bottom would be going what direction? Away. The current at the top is going to the left. If I turn this like that, that's coming towards you. And that's what I'm representing here. Think of this as a donut. I wish I had thought to bring a donut. I'm hungry. But if I had a donut and I broke it in half, this represents the back half of the donut. We've taken a cross section of our loop. And what this says is that current is going away from you at the bottom, up the back, and out the top. Okay, like that. Okay? And what we find is that the field lines are going to the left on the outside, 
and they're going to the right on the inside. Okay? Think of that again. They were coming towards you in the center. I turn that and they're going towards the open door. They're going away from you outside the loop. I turn that and they're going away from the open door. Make sense? Now, that field you've seen before, it is the field of a bar magnet. And that means that I can replace a current loop with a little bar magnet. I can define a north side of that loop and a south side of that loop. And the way I remember which side is north and which, way, which side is south is right hand rule number three. Okay, that's my, right, my last right hand rule. That's the good news. It's the last one. Now, here's my message to you. Problems involving current loops are hard, are incredibly hard, until you replace that loop with a little bar magnet. And then you just remember what you learned in the third grade. If I had a little bar magnet here and it was free to rotate, which way would it rotate? As soon as you replace a loop with a bar magnet, Every single one of those problems become trivial if you think like a third grader, okay? Now, there's a current loop. Those are the field lines. They're coming out of the left of the loop and going into the right of the loop, kind of like that. And those are the fields that we got when we had a bar magnet. And so we think of that current loop as a bar magnet. Now, which side of that loop is north? <coughs> it's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Kind of depends on which one of those arrows is closer to you. And that's why I'm going to try to avoid that notation. I'm going to try to draw my, my loops this way as a cross section. And here, it's clear that the current is going away from you at the bottom and towards you at the top. And so that means that the north side of this loop is going to be to the right. Okay? Now, we talked about the Earth's magnetic field, that the field lines came out of the south pole and then came down into the north pole. Uh, by, by south and north, I mean geomet geometric Geographic, <laughs> that's the word I mean. This is my first, third lecture of the day. So I'm just, I'm doing my best. <laughs> okay, what we know is because the field lines are coming out of Antarctica, that's where the north magnetic pole is of the Earth. And because the field lines come down into Hudson Bay in Canada, that's where the south pole of the Earth's magnetic uh, dipole is. Now, we think, we sort of understand this dipole. We think, this is the best theory we got, that there's motion of material under the surface of the Earth. And you can think of it as flowing around the equator. And with that bulk motion of, of, of material, also travels charge, making a current loop around the equator of the Earth. Now the question is, which way would the current have to travel around the equator in order to give me that bar magnet? Would it go east to west or west to east? If I think about the United States being right here in front, where we always think of the United States, uh, would the current be traveling from San Francisco to Boston or Boston to San Francisco? Talk to your neighbor. Which is it? Okay. <laughs> Which way? East to west or west to east? East to west. 
east to west, okay? By right hand rule number three, it's got to go around the front of the earth this way in order to give me a north magnetic pole down here where <coughs> the penguins are, okay? Now the earth spins the other way, but the flow of the charge has to be uh, in the opposite direction from Boston to San Francisco, okay? Which makes sense if you're talking about conventional charge, right? That's conventional charge. So electron current would have to go the other way. Okay, it shouldn't surprise you, and you saw this in your tutorial, that if one loop of current looks like a short bar magnet, lots of turns of current, lots of loops together in what we call a solenoid, just looks like a long bar magnet. Okay? And I can define a north and a south pole for that solenoid. Now I have a solenoid here. It's not, uh, it doesn't have any current going through it right now because I haven't pushed the button. When I push the button, conventional current's going to come down this lead. It's going to go around this solenoid this way. That's going to make this side here with the black lead the North Pole, okay? Now, if this is the North Pole, it should be repelled by the North Pole of this bar magnet, and it is. Now that means that the other pole should be attracted to this North Pole, and it is. The South Pole, on the other hand, should repel this red end, and sure enough it does. So this hanging solenoid acts exactly the same as if I had just hung a bar magnet from a string and allowed it to rotate like a compass needle. This solenoid acts like a bar magnet or more importantly, this bar magnet acts like a solenoid. Why would that be? Why would that be? Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to look at a hunk of iron, and we're just going to look at a cross-section of it. And you remember that I said last day that every atom of iron has a dipole associated with it, a little north and a little south. Well, now we know that a little north and a little south can also be associated with a, a current loop, a little loop of current. So let's suppose that we got all the atoms that I could represent as current loops. Suppose I got them all aligned so that they were spinning the same way. Okay? So this is what it would look like. Each of that represents one atom, okay? And that atom has a north and a south pole, and I can, I can represent that with a current loop that goes clockwise. And so the north pole would be pointing into the board, the south pole out of the board. And I get them all lined up so that they're all going around clockwise. Now, <laughs> uh, let's look at what happens inside the iron. If I look inside the iron, say here, this atom has current going up and this one has current going down. They cancel. If I look here, this one has current going to your left, this one has current going to your right, they cancel. If I look here at a, at a corner, this one has current going up and to the left, down and to the left, down and to the right, up and to the right, they cancel. They cancel everywhere, except on the edges. On the edges, there's nothing to cancel that little current loop, and so it looks like I've got current on the edge. There, and 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 there. Okay? Everywhere else it cancels, so what that looks like, that hunk of iron looks like 
a current loop around the outside of the metal. Now, this piece of iron, if it were magnetized, doesn't really have current going around it. But it appears to, because all of those little atoms are lined up so that their current loops are not canceled. We call that magnetization current. Now, I couldn't get through that without smiling and a little bit of chuckling, because in the old days when I was younger, I had a great big box of tennis balls, and I would throw out tennis balls to everyone in the class, and you'd all get up and you'd turn the same way. And then I'd get up on the tables and jump from table to table and show you how the current canceled at different places. Well, a couple of years back, I was jumping from table to table, heavy as I am, and I had a little problem with my shoe where I had a little nail head that was sticking out. I jumped, I hit, I slid, and I came straight down straddling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and class was over. <laughs> and for weeks, everyone would say, hi, Dr. Francis, and then chuckle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel it. Okay. Now, how do we get all of those little current loops lined up in the first place? I mean, if I had you all stand up with a tennis ball going around the same direction, that's not the most obvious way you'd be rotating. Some of you have been lying on the table going around. Some of you have been standing on your head going around. would be in all different orientations. The way you line these up is you use the fact that a loop produces a B field like a bar magnet. And a bar magnet will line up in an external magnetic field. It's a compass needle. And, and so if I have a magnetic field and I have a little loop in it, well, this is a hard problem unless I replace this with a little bar magnet. It goes in there and out there. By right hand rule three, that gives me a north pole that way. Okay? That little bar magnet would rotate to line up with the field. Okay? Now, let's magnetize a steel rod. Uh, I take this rod and I put it in the presence of a very strong magnetic field. By very strong, I mean every single time that I use this magnet, my credit cards don't work afterwards. I meant to leave my wallet in my office, I just forgot. So I'll just call the companies again. <laughs> uh, I've got a, a brilliant uh, hammer, a special hammer that doesn't stick. And, and I just tap this. I just want to jiggle the atoms so that they're free to rotate. And the field is going to line them up. Now I have a bunch of paper clips here. Let's see if this is magnetized. Whoa, yeah, that's a magnet. Now, how do I get those dipoles that are all lined up to go random again? How do I demagnetize this iron rod? Well, some of you did it in lab. Just by dropping your magnets. You just, oops, oops. And then we had to go behind you and magnetize them again. Okay. If I just keep on dropping that, I get them all jiggled up. And now, it's not a magnet. Not a magnet. Now, here's another way that I can magnetize this. I have here a solenoid. This solenoid is just a coil. And I'm going to hook it to a DC source, like a battery, that's going to send current always the same direction around the coil. That means this coil is always going to have a north side, always going to have a south side. If I pass this through that solenoid, the magnetic field in the center of the solenoid is going to line up all the atoms of the iron. And sure enough, I've got a magnet again. Now, another way I could demagnetize this is I could disconnect this coil from the DC battery and hook it instead to AC. 
Now, I want to talk to those of you that are going to be teachers, high school teachers. You don't want one of these in your classroom. Okay? You see why, right? If you have one of these, lock it up. And when you use it, always be sure to plug this end in first. Okay? I'm just trying to keep you alive. Okay, now it's safe to plug this end in. Now, when I plug this in, I'm going to change the direction of the magnetic field in that solenoid back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, 120 times a second. Back and forth, back and forth. Okay? Say it with me. Back and forth, back and forth. Okay, so now when I put this magnetized rod through, the direction of the field is switching back and forth so quickly, it's just confusing it. It's just randomizing all those atoms of iron. And it's going to be demagnetized. Sure enough, nothing. Now, there's one more way to magnetize it. I wouldn't encourage you to do it this way, but it works a little. If you line this up with the Earth's magnetic field, which is towards Canada, down 70 degrees, and you tap that, you can magnetize it a little. Another way to demagnetize a rod is to heat it. And as you heat that rod, you're increasing the thermal energy, the random energy of all those atoms. When you get to what's called the Curie temperature, you decouple the neighbors and it no longer becomes a magnet. See if your neighbor knows three ways to magnetize a rod, three ways to demagnetize it. It won't be on the test, but see if they know. Talk to your neighbor. Okay, people, I was rushing through that because this is what I wanted to get to. A lot of you are thinking that magnetism is just the craziest, hardest, most complicated thing you've ever encountered. And I'm here to show you that it's really simple. I'm going to try to paint the picture, the big picture, of the magnetic force. It's important to think of this magnetic force, or magnetic push, as a two-step dance. Something creates a magnetic field, step one, and then that magnetic field pushes on something else, step two. Let's look at step one. There are only three ways to set up a magnetic field. Fifty ways to leave a lover. Uh, three ways. Okay. The first way is with a bar magnet. And what we found is that the magnetic field lines come out of the north, wrap around and go into a south. Out of the north, wrap around and into a south. Now, typically when we're using a bar magnet, we're using the poles. We're either near a North Pole or near a South Pole. And so what we really care about is away from a North Pole and towards a South Pole. Okay? That's way number one. Way number two is with a solenoid. If I have a bunch of coils, And let's say the current is going into the board at the bottom and out of the board at the top. So this is one current. It goes in and out, in and out, in and out, in and round and round and round. Now, we can use right hand rule number three. To define a north pole of that solenoid, we put the curved part of our hand in the direction of the coil, 
our thumb is pointing in the direction of the north side of that solenoid. That's also the direction that field lines are going through the solenoid. They come out of the north, wrap around, and go into the south. Out of the north, wrap around, and into the south. Now we know from superposition that a solenoid is just a bunch of loops. And in a loop, the field goes through. And so that tells us what the field lines do inside of the solenoid. Outside they go from north to south. Inside they go from south to north to finish the loop. Okay? Now because a solenoid and a bar magnet act exactly the same, because the bar magnet is just a kind of a solenoid, we know that field lines inside a bar magnet also go from south to north to complete the loop. Now that's where it's dark. We can't put a compass. But by using this analogy with the solenoid, we know that these field lines, if they come out of the north, go into the south, they have to keep on going back to the north. Okay? So that's way number two. And way number three is if I have a long, straight, current-carrying wire, okay, if that's conventional current coming towards you, I know by right-hand rule number two, the field lines are going to be circles that go around that. By right-hand rule number two, I can remember which way they wrap around. I use the straight part of my hand to represent the straight current. My fingers are curling in the direction of the B field line. Now the B lines paint the picture everywhere, but if I just want the magnetic field there, it would be a vector that is tangent to the line. If I wanted the vector here, it would be a direction tangent to the line. Those are the three ways to set up a magnetic field. That's step one of the two-step dance. The next step is that the magnetic field pushes on something else. Well, one way is to push on a moving charge. If I have a magnetic field that's pointing towards that open door, and it's a uniform magnetic field because the field lines are evenly spaced. If I have a positive charge that is moving across those field lines, by, uh, I'm going to have a magnetic force. That magnetic force is going to have a magnitude QBB sine theta. And since we're looking for the magnitude of that force, we use the magnitude of the charge. If it's an electron, we never put a negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 there. We just want to know the strength of the magnetic push. Now the direction of the push is given by which right hand rule? Number one, we've already used two and three up there. Now, again, I reach in the direction of the motion, I turn my wrist in the direction of the B field, and so I can wave in the direction of the B field, and that's my angle theta. And so the force here would be into the page on a positive charge. Now, the second way that we can push on something is if we have a wire carrying charge, well, if each of those charges is pushed with a magnetic force, so is the wire. So if I have a magnetic field towards the open door, again, and I have a wire, let's say it's got a green coating on it, and that wire is carrying conventional current this way, And let's say that that wire is length L. <coughs> then the magnetic force 
per unit length, the push, the total push, is going to depend on how long the wire is. So if you just want the push per unit length, it's going to be the current times the B field times the sine of the angle between them. You're never going to use that formula, okay? But I just wanted you to see it. You are going to use the, the fact that the direction, the direction of that force is given by right-hand rule number one. And again, the force would be in all along the wire. Okay, now the last two cases both deal with a push or a pull on a bar magnet. In the first case, we have a uniform magnetic field, by which I mean field lines that are evenly spaced. If I lay a bar magnet down in that, I can think of that north pole as the arrowhead on a compass needle. That compass needle is going to turn around, it's just going to rotate and line up with the B field. Now I can think of that as happening because the North Pole is being pulled in the direction of the B field and the South Pole is being pulled in the opposite direction. Now, if the, if the field is uniform, that's going to rotate the bar magnet And now I can think of those forces on the north in the same direction as B, and the south in the opposite direction. If these forces are equal and opposite, it doesn't go anywhere. It just lines up and stops, like a compass needle. Now the last case is super interesting. If I've got a magnetic field that is not uniform, and those field lines aren't parallel, this would indicate a strong magnetic field and a weak magnetic field. This would be the kind of field lines I'd have near, say, a south pole. Either the south pole of a bar magnet or the south pole of a solenoid. Now, if I lay a bar magnet down, and I use the idea that the north is pulled in the direction of B, south in the opposite direction, this bar magnet is going to spin around and line up with the field. And here's what makes this different. The North Pole is in the region of a strong magnetic field. It feels a big pole. The South Pole is in a weak magnetic field. It feels a small pole. And this thing's just going to get sucked in to that pole. But you knew that since the third grade. If you have a great big south pole sitting on your table, and you lay a little bar magnet down on the table, it's going to quickly flip around so the north is towards the south, and then it's going to suck clear across the table until it goes clang and hits it. Now I can demonstrate that. This is really, oh man, we got three minutes. This is going to be the best three minutes of your life. <laughs> I have here a solenoid that's going to generate, when I hit this switch, a, a non-uniform magnetic field. That's going to magnetize this bar magnet and suck it in. Watch. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, at University of Washington, they had a great big <laughs> coil, huge coil. And they had it hooked up to 14 12-volt batteries to get a huge current. They had a great big iron core, and they would start with two feet of it outside of the, of the coil. When they pushed the button, it would come zipping in, just really, really fast, zip it in, and just stay in the middle. It didn't take us very long to figure out that if you push the button, get it zipping in, and then release the button when it gets in the middle, it went right out the other side, and it's a rail gun. Yeah. Now, we've got one minute. Hold on. Uh, Will you give me two minutes? Thank you.
when you turn on your car, you're going to need 75 amps to turn over your engine. Trust me, you don't want 75 amps going through your steering call. Uh, that's dangerous. So what we have on top of the starter is a solenoid, just a coil. That solenoid has a, an iron plunger in it, and that, that solenoid is hooked up through the ignition. So that when you turn your key, you send a little bit of current through the coil, that magnetizes the solenoid and, and drags that iron core down into the center. They use that to close the real switch that has the 75 amps in it, so that you don't have to get anywhere near that. Now, a fellow has used that idea to make a very clever device. Okay. All he's using is a little copper wire, some magnets, and a battery. He puts magnets on either side. They have to be either north towards north or south towards south. Now, watch what else he can do with this. <laughs> okay, it gets better. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, folks, have a good weekend.